So I'm gonna, I have no disclosures, and I have parents' approval to tell this story um, and to show you these pictures. Um, this is a story about a nine-year-old who went swimming one day, choked on some water, as much as we can figure out from the history, um, developed kind of a rash on his back and a dry cough, and later that day went to the ER, they gave him some Benadryl. Uh, the next day he went back to the ER, still not feeling really great. They did a chest x-ray, it was all normal. A Couple days later he went back. Um, he was in respiratory distress by now. Um, he had a chest x-ray with right-sided infiltrates, pleural effusion. He was placed on BiPAP and then transferred to a regional hospital. Um, a Couple days later, chest um, CT demonstrated some ground glass opacities. Um, he had viral pneumonitis or hypersensitive reaction to something. Um, he was epoxic. Um, they admitted him uh, or kept him there. Uh, tried CPAP, tried um, nasal cannula, high flow nasal cannula. He developed a right pneumothorax, um, ended up with small Pneumoth left pneumothorax, they put a pigtail catheter in, um, he had a laryngeal spasm which caused him to be emergently intubated, he had frank blood in the ET tube, um, he received steroids, uh, chest x-ray still didn't look that bad, um, bronchoscopy noted unremarkable airways, uh, they did an infectious workup that was negative, uh, he had a lung biopsy, those things showed negative. They tried extubating him, um, didn't go well. They ended up having to re-intubate him. Um, they tried flow land, they tried no, uh, many things. They tried plasmapheresis. Uh, nothing was, they couldn't figure out what was going on with this little guy. Um, they ended up having to trach. And then on hospital day 31, he had emergency VV ECMO. He had frank bleeding from the chest tubes. Um, he had a genetic panel that this was the first time they might have had an idea of what went wrong or what was the cause. He had um, a, gene a genetic um, comeback that um, had two variants in it, and one of the variants was also linked to possibly um, low surfactant. But that was the only thing that they found um, that could possibly explain this. So they did all kinds of infectious workup. Everything was negative. Uh, we did a lot of microbial therapy and um, treatment for ARDS. Uh, and so we were requested to come get this guy and to bring him to LPCH um, on the 3rd. And this is ECMO day 14. So um, at that time, he, was, he still had some bleeding. Just before we got there, he had had um, hemothorax. They turned the heparin off and uh, kind of got the bleeding under control. Still no idea of what was going on. So when you go on transport, you have a lot of stuff to take. So this is our gurney going into the hospital with all the stuff for transport. Um, when we, we went ahead and put him on a cardio help to transport back. When we, the surgeon had a little bit of trouble trying to get our circuit on. And I think in the process, he repositioned the cannula. It was an Avalon cannula. And so when we went on our circuit, we had really high negatives, we had low flow. We had an increased recirculation, desaturations. Um, they didn't believe anything was wrong. They thought it was my circuit. But luckily, we have a shunt on our cardio help, so we were able to test the internal um, pressures. So we hooked up monitored um, transducers to our circuit and proved that this is really real. We really had a high negative, and we, and we weren't flowing well. Um, the shunt that we use also allows us to, once we get back, to uh, put a CDI in, keep, mo keep monitoring. It also allows us to do CVVH off the circuit if we need to. So anyway, the cannula was repositioned with TEE. We got better negatives, uh, flows increased, less recirculation. They ended up taking the sutures off, reapplying it, and we were looking pretty good at about a negative 60 uh, with our flows. Uh, here we are ready to get onto the um, fixed wing. So the, from trip to the hospital to the airport, through, including the flight back to LPCH, was about a six hour trip. On the trip, everything was fine. Flows stayed good. Um, we didn't have any trouble with our gases. There's one set of gases listed down below. We still have heparin off. ACTs are around 130 to 140. Uh, pre's and posts were good. Our delta stayed good. Uh, negatives went up a little bit. Um, and we had a little bit of recirculation, but our 
our gases were still looking okay. So in looking at kids with um, ARDS, uh, this has been, a, we've been putting people on ECMO for this for about 40 years. And the indications that allow us to do this are growing. There's really probably not very many um, obstacles now to keep us from going on with um, ECMO. Uh, if you're on the ventilator a long time, your, your mortality rate is um, 38%. If you're on less than 14 days, it's somewhere around 47 to 58%. So it's still 50% mortality. Um, we also, uh, this article also looked at most kids are deeply sedated and paralyzed, which is going to really hurt for rehabilitation if they can't move. Um, it's also going to keep them from breathing. So you're going to end up breathing for them because if you paralyze them, they can't take a breath. And with this little guy, um, we, had, we wanted to lessen the sedation and get towards some kind of rehab mobilization. Uh, but we had a really hard time doing that. Um, there's a lot of cases where um, the comorbidities are, we're still putting people on for um, different comorbidities. The um, current therapies that you're putting into your ECMO circuits and that, that you do for kids, those are increasing, like plasmapheresis um, is one of those. Uh, so there's kind of like no barriers now for um, what we're going to put people on ECMO for. So he was very sedated. Our goal was to get him off. Here's some of the drugs that he was on. We, once we got back, we were trying to get these off. We couldn't. As soon as we started to lessen the sedation and the paralysis, he would become very anxious. He'd overbreathe. Um, he'd move around. And then he'd reposition the cannula. And so we'd get recirculation. We'd get poor flows. So we ended up having to keep him sedated for a while. Um, we'd like to get them unsedated. But he, was, he just continued to be very anxious. And we had lots of different ventilation strategies, strategies uh, had little improvement. So on day 43, we had 20, uh, 28 days under our care. He's still sedated and paralyzed most of the time. Anytime we increased the heparin, his pneumothorax would start bleeding again. And so we had to keep the heparin off for a lot of this. And at this point in time, we've given almost 5,000 cc's of RBCs, 300 FFP, 1,600 of platelets, and 800 of cryo. He has a poor prognosis still, um, and we've, we're looking at very, very low chance of um, lung recovery. So we needed a new plan. So we decided to do central cannulation and do an RA to RV ECMO. Uh, so we went to the OR on day 43. Um, median sterotomy, on pump, we decannulated the neck, and we put in a right atrial drain and a right ventricular return. Um, when we came off, or got on ECMO, and we were ready to move it towards out of the room, we did an echo to make sure everything still looked good. He still had good vent biventricular function. Um, his right heart looked good. He had good flow through the cannulas. We were at about 2.5, which was good for him. Um, saturation was good, systolic pressure was 100, and his PA systolic was 22. So we're pretty happy with where we were setting. So in the, in the OR, we tried to keep the circuit as small as possible. So we opened everything up to the sterile field. We were able to put um, plastic sterile drapes over the motor and the mounts. We were able to slide the revolution cone in over the plastic so everything still stayed sterile. We um, didn't puncture any holes in that. Same with the um, quadrox holder. And so the picture on the right is the, the ECMO circuit very close to the table with very short tubing. Um, we can't, on Hospital 48, five days after revision, we still had some drugs going to help with um, cardiac output. We were maintaining oxygenation and ventilation well. Um, he still had um, some lung recruitment strategies that we were trying. He's, he was still on steroids, so we were on a slow taper for that. Uh, we em removed the ET and opened up his trach again. Uh, that was um, kind of getting us somewhere to see if we could try to get him um, awake and moving again. Uh, we did start lung transplant, transplant workup to see if we could get him um, listed. Uh, we are full ventilator support, um, trying lots of different ventilation strategies. Uh, 
our flows were good. We didn't have much trouble with the circuit once we got the cannulas to central cannulation. We had no trouble at all with the circuit. Um, his rehab was a little slow, range of motion, um, those kind of things that we started off with. He just had no will to do it, plus he was really weak. Um, the challenge is right now we're bleeding anticoagulation. Every time we tried to up the anticoagulation, he'd bleed. So we had to reduce anticoagulation. We went without anticoagulation quite a bit. His anxiety was a huge issue uh, because you, you, you just couldn't control him once he started to wake up. And he was really progressing very slowly in a positive direction. So I went and looked at all the blood we gave. And this four-week mark in the middle, I'm going to refer to this a little bit later on, but realize that we had four weeks in the middle of all this. We really didn't give much blood. Um, the first bunch of blood we gave was, of course, when he was having the hemothorax and we were trying to heparinize and we couldn't. And then when we went to the OR, we ended up having another blood loss that we had to deal with. And then later in his course, we ended up changing the circuit several times. And so we would end up u utilizing some blood loss in that. So overall, for his six-month stay with us, we put in about 20, almost 20,000 cc's of blood product. I looked at how our anticoagulation was placed. And we gave heparin. We, gave, we turned heparin off. During the first set of t um, weeks, we were on again, off again with heparin. We kept trying to turn it back on. We were afraid that we were going to keep losing our circuits. So then we went to a period of time with no heparin. Then we added heparin again. We added some ASA with it. Then we tried warfarin. Then we tried bivalrutin. Then we put, went back to heparin. Then we tried, added some lovinox. Then we went back to heparin. So we tried lots of things. And um, you'll see that this four-week period, here is where we had really low PTTs. For, oh yeah, the first the top graph is PTT. The bottom graph is um, antithrombin or anti 10A. So we had um, very low PTTs. We were subtherapeutic the whole time on the HAL uh, for that four week period. And so these purple lines are the circuit changes in the first 100 days. Um, they worked out almost an average of one a week. And then the next lines are still circuit changes. We changed the circuit out on him 16 times. And um, it wasn't because we had lots of clots. So I, went, I flushed every circuit at, at the end of what we did. And he had the, the usual culprits, clot in the corners. But in the cardio helps, we found that some of the outflow tubes would clot. Um, and so when we, when we were changing circuits, our pre and post rarely changed. Our deltas rarely changed. Um, we tried different anticoagulation regimes they didn't help. We ended up with elevated LDHs for this. And um, sometimes we would, even though we knew the LDH was going up, to try to keep from changing the circuit, we would wait a little bit too long. And when we did that, he would get petechiae. And that would be the, the real rush to get a circuit changed. Um, trying to keep the circuit on as long as we can, but yet don't expose him to another surface area and try to reduce our blood use. In the quadrox and the cone, same thing. We ended up with some rotor clot um, and then the usual culprits around the oxygenator. But our oxygenator function was always good. So I went looking for how can we manage this kid um, anticoagulation. I found this um, one paper that was written in 12 who said that you shouldn't follow PTTs. Most of the world has stopped doing that. I bet if you raise your hand right now, there's a whole bunch of us who still use PTTs to follow this. Um, and so they mentioned that PTTs are different from one laboratory to the next, and you needed to know what reagents are being used. Um, we had a case just this last week where our first um, kind of understanding that reagents make a difference in that we had a PTT of 180. We sent, the lab retested it with a different reagent, and the PTT came back 53. So you could see if you got that 180, you'd turn everything off, um, and it, it really wasn't a true number once we got the other reagent. So I need to learn a little bit more about that. Um, so th some of the um, things they recommended in this paper is if you're going to use APPT, then you need to correspond it with a heparin concentration or a HANA 10A. That way you know you have heparin on board in, a, in an amount that's, that, that's good, and then you see what your APPT is and, and set your goals according to that once you know you have enough heparin on board. Um, they also talked about most of the centers had moved to this, uh, but I don't think many centers really have, in my experience. Um, they think that by using um, 
anti factor A, which we call HAL, uh, heparin activity level, um, that you'll get a smoother um, redose response uh, curve and that you'll, you'll do fewer samples because you're not doing um, lab values as often as we would ACTs and that you'll adjust the doses difference. Uh, another paper in 17 um, tried to do or looked at a survey and, and found that um, there's so much variation in the practice of anticoagulation and transfusion that there isn't a norm. Um, they found that in most cases uh, we all use heparin, sometimes heparin and bivalrudin, sometimes bivalrudin only, sometimes argatroban. The majority follow ACTs, 160 to 200, but they really didn't specify which machines were being used. The PTT was a, a majority of people used it. They ran 60 to 80, but they did not use a heparin concentration target along with it. Um, very few people used TEGS in this survey. Uh, half of them did monitor anisotropin 3, and they wanted to keep it above 50. Not all people treated it. If they treat it, they usually use thrombate. So we used argatroban for a while, and we still do. We find it is true. It is a more steady anticoagulation. It very well could be that because you're only sending lab to the, or sending um, blood to the lab every four to eight hours, you don't move your dose. You have no numbers to make you want to move your dose. So that might be why that if we did ACTs every four to eight hours, we probably wouldn't move our dose much either. But we found that we start our initial infusion at 0.02. Um, we found that if you look it up in the online, they'll tell you that the starting dose is 2.0 mgs per kg. Um, this is not for being on ECMO. This is for patients on HIT. And um, so we found really fast because our population, once we started using this, the first time we used it, we had, we were bleeding. Um, and so when we went back and looked after we had used this for about eight to 10 months, our, nor our range was very wide. Um, as low as 0.02 mgs per kg, as far as, up to as much as five mgs per kg. So the population responds to this drug very differently. You need to worry about their liver function when you're using this. So we just, set, we just decided to set, start everybody at 0.02 and then we'd work up from there. And we end up, you know, so oftentimes in the 0.8 range, 0.5 to 0.8 range, but you just never know which patient is going to respond to this um, severely. So they talked about circuit changes in this paper. Um, when do you do it? Most of the people watched gas transfer and changed it for those reasons. Um, they, or an increased pressure drop across the membrane with evidence of thrombus. Um, but again, they concluded that there was no ideal coagulation or laboratory target that would determine or help you prevent um, thrombus. So in our circuit changes, our gases were fine. Um, even towards the end of, a, of that oxygenator's life, we would still be able to generate PO2s in the 200s. Um, they also mentioned that with heparin, you need to worry about um, what's going on along with your testing. And so if you're using the um, anti-10A to, to monitor heparin as well as PTT, you need to worry about is there severe hemolysis and is there high bilirubins. So I went back and looked at our bilirubins. And um, the whole time our bilirubins were low. Uh, they were well below one um, on the whole run. And then I also looked at our L LDHs. They were high the entire time. So it might mean that we had a lot of um, hemolysis going on that we didn't know. We had large cannulas. Um, we had good negatives once we settled into the, um, the central cannulated circuit. Uh, so not sure why we ended up, we still don't know why we ended up with this, these HDLs that were, or LDHs that were so high, as well as our circuit changes. Pretty much every one of those, those peaks on this graph are circuit change places. So our, our circuit that we uh, went to when we went to, to central cannulation, we tried to keep it as small as we could. Um, so we, ha we had two pigtails on it that we could do pre and post pressures. We monitored those for a while and then we stopped monitoring so we could get rid of the pigtails. Uh, we eliminated as many connectors as we could. Later on in the run, we actually changed him to a pediatric quadrox so that we could reduce surface area, think that maybe it was our surface area that was causing some of our problems. We used taper flex so that we could keep from having step down connectors. And we've used this technique a lot and it seems to really work for us well. Um, uh, it allows you to go from three eighths to quarter and have no connectors in it. Um, we 
got him in on this little circuit. We started getting him up. This is well, this is at least halfway into his run. So we got, finally got him sitting in a um, wheelchair. And we found out that probably almost more important than what his labs were looking like every day is how he was feeling and his perceptions of what were going on. And so we, when we had the cardio help on, we have a, a big platform. Um, it's similar to the platform that CardioQuip has out there now, that it's the Soren Sperner cart. So you have a heater cooler on the bottom, you have the, the pump on top, you have IV poles sticking up, you have a blender, there's lots of hoses on there, and that just made him nervous. When we moved the circuit away from him and put just the oxygenator and the pump beside him, um, as in the picture here, uh, you could, he, he reacted differently. It, he felt more secure without having all this equipment around him. That little red arrow is just showing you that's the cord that heads over to the circuit, and it's the power cord for the motor and the um, cord for the flow prom. We have a um, really robust uh, P o OTPT group. We've done lots of um, rehab for our bad kids. Um, many a time I've been running down the hallway with a Berlin pump trying to keep up with a kid on a tricycle. And so we've, we have a pretty good history of getting kids up and rehab so that when they do get their transplant, they're in pretty good health. So I went and looked at um, what our run looked like. So the green lines are O2. So the solid green line is our FiO2 on our pump. And then the dotted line is the FiO2 on the ventilator. And the yellow line down below is our sweep flows throughout the run. And then I went and looked at um, the gray line is our ECMO run. It was pretty stable the whole time once we got to central cannulation. The red line is, I just, it's a subjective coding. I looked at what was going on with our circuit, what was going on with him that might um, cause problems with rehab. And so a lot of those spikes are circuit changes. And sometimes before he would get a circuit change, you could almost watch his personality and his personality would change a little bit um, as he was getting towards the end of this circuit and his LDHs were going up. Um, and so as our circuit got towards an end, he, didn't, he wasn't as readily willing to participate in rehab. So then I went and looked at our rehab course. So the purple line is all the rehab. And this is just a subjective code. And I went through and read all the summaries, the daily summaries of the rehab people. And I took things like, um, not very energetic, only stood for three seconds, um, not really willing to participate, as a low, code, a low score. And then I took the wording like, stood for three more minutes than we planned, was really energetic, um, walked 150 feet today, and I made that kind of a positive score. And then I looked back and compared this just by looking at the two, and you can see that while we're on circuit, we get some rehab, but um, once we get off circuit, that's really when the rehab really takes off. It could very well be um, his, his dependence on this circuit. He knew he did, was dependent on it. And he was very cognizant. When he, had, when he had a new nurse, he watched them like a hawk. They would walk in the room, and his eyes would just follow them and watch them every moment. Um, we found that he was very watchful of our circuit, too. And so if we made a change in flows, he would notice that. If we made a change in sweep, he would kind of notice that. So we had to start making sure that when we made changes, we tried not to let him know about this. So here's um, one of his first trips out of the room. Um, he's looking pretty good there compared to what he's looked like that first month. Um, and it takes a village of people to get this to happen. So Halloween, you know, we had him through all the holidays. So of course we had to do the Halloween run. So we have um, a parade that goes through all the units and all the kids who can dress up and we take them through all the units so they can get candy and little toys and stuff. So this is his mom and dad and many of the people in ICU and his jack-o'-lantern ECMO circuit. Um, so this is just before Christmas and you'll notice that the blood in the tubing is pretty dark. There's no A and V going on here. Um, we have the gas off. We didn't tell him. We couldn't tell him. At one point when we wanted to try to start weaning, um, he was just so scared and the anxiety got over him and we couldn't wean. So we finally sneaked this up on him. We started turning the flow down, didn't tell him, um, and we got it totally off. We had it totally off for a week before we even told dad because they'd be too excited. And so um, we got down to where all we were doing was pushing venous blood around. 
So we went to the um, OR on uh, ECMO 160 days, um, and we finally did get it out. We attempted this about a week before, and because he had a trach, and because he had some anatomy differences in his um, uh, trachea, when we put the NG tube in, it deviated a little bit. So we were about to kind of start the surgery, and he started decompensating. Um, and just being nervous, we've had this kid on for 150 some days by then. So we just went ahead, turned the circuit back on, got him back, went back to the, the unit to try to figure out what might have went on. That was probably the worst day in all of our lives. When parents see you coming back from the OR and you still have this ECMO circuit in tow, it's so depressing. But we got through, got it, finally got it out in a couple of days. This is a couple of days afterwards. He's on a little epi, on a little dopa. Um, he's venting well. He's now got a tidal volume of six to seven per, mi per kilogram, per, or millimeters per kilogram. When he was on circuit and we would try to wake him up, if he had a good breath, he could generate this. But most of the time, if he was a little sedated, he was only generating one or two cc's uh, per kilogram. So this is when really the magic of rehab starts. You're not on the circuit. And so we're able to get him up walking around. And our, we have a new hospital. We have probably the prettiest hospital in the world. So we have artwork all over this. So there's a case of one of the statues that's in, at the end of one of the hallways. And so some of this rehab was walking around the hospital looking at all the artwork. The uh, picture on the right is him about two days before um, heading back home for, um, to get into a rehab hospital. So this is going home day. Um, he went home with meds for breathing, for hypertension, for anxiety, um, sleep, nutrition, and some prophylactic antibiotic. So nine months after the swimming incident, three months off ECMO, and two months back home, um, he's looking pretty good. So do we know when we go too far? I don't think we do. And I don't think we'll know. I think you just keep trying. And as you listen to more and more ECMO stories, you hear more about those times where you kind of, the team had kind of given up, but they, the family hadn't given up. And you, all of a sudden, four months later, the lungs just start working again. So there's lots of, of literature out there where you don't know when lungs are going to start working again. So I think we're all going to have um, a lot of these cases that you don't know whether they're going to have a positive outcome or not, and um, you just do. We'll probably still have those that you don't, but uh, you never know, so you have to keep going. So this is our new hospital, and this is just a picture, the three pictures um, of some of the artwork. These are bronze statues and they're all over the hospital. There's probably a hundred of them, and they're all at knee level. So a two-year-old can look at these and walk around and touch them. It's um, a pretty amazing place. So if you're ever in Palo Alto and you have nothing to do in an afternoon, come look at our hospital. Any questions?